I think we are correct now. I apologize for that. Okay, so a brief outline of today's content. Uh, we'll have intros. That's going to be really brief to let more people um, show up. And then we will get into the main content. Uh, it will be about 25 minutes. Then, uh, as usual, we have a special announcement with a offer just for those of you live here in the room, followed by a Q&A. And Q&A can run anywhere from uh, historically 10 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on how many of you have questions uh, for Kathy. So very quickly about me. My name is R. I'm the CEO of SYB, the host of the Healthier Tech podcast, formerly uh, faculty uh, at the University of Southern California. Along with my father, Dr. Martin Blank, I co-authored Overpowered about the science of EMF health effects. And this all follows a 20-year career in software engineering. So we wanted to do this webinar today because we hear from a lot of people from all around the world about how difficult it has become to travel, specifically flying. It's literally one of the top three things that I and my customer service team are asked about. The increasing amount of EMF devices that you're exposed to in a very confined space has increased exponentially in the last few years. Even without these exposures, flying is inherently unhealthy and foreign to what the human body can understand, what we've evolved to cope with. The human body is simply not meant to move through space at several hundred miles per hour across time zones in a matter of minutes and sit in a chair inside of a metal box at 30,000 feet. But of course, we live in the modern world and this type of travel has become a normal part of our lives. Many of us live far from friends and family and we'd like to see them. Many people need to travel for work or for healthcare. For some people, traveling is a passion. There are a lot of reasons why sometimes we need to get on a plane. And because of that, we wanted to share with you how you can do that more comfortably, how to protect your body and how to enjoy your journey with more health and vitality. And for that, we called on our uh, own in-house senior EMF consultant, Kathy Cook, to help us out. I know this topic is a passion for her, and as I suspected, she has loads of information to share. Pardon me one second. Zoom controls are being obnoxiously in the way. So. Uh, Kathy is a board is board certified in holistic nutrition as well as a certified building biology environmental consultant and certified electromagnetic radiation specialist with the building biology Institute. In her practice, she assesses buildings for anything that may be causing health problems. This includes indoor air quality mold chemical off gassing ventilation combustible gas products carbon monoxide carbon dioxide radon and, of course, EMF exposure. She has combined holistic nutrition and building biology to address both the body and the environment to help her clients achieve optimal health. Kathy currently lives in Boise, Idaho, and you can check her website at wholehomeandbodyhealth.com. And just quickly, before I introduce Kathy, a quick reminder to everybody, we will be having a Q&A session uh, following the presentation. So if at any point questions occur to you, uh, don't put them into the chat pod, put them into the Q&A pod, because that's where we're going to look uh, when it's time for the Q&A. So with that, I am uh, happy to introduce Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Hello, R. Hello, uh, everyone in this fantastic Shield Your Body community. Really happy to be here with you guys today and uh, talk about this topic. Um, and like R mentioned, uh, I am very passionate about this topic, and the reason is because in full disclosure i kind of loathe flying don't get me wrong i love to visit other parts of the world and experience new cultures and places and I, I love to travel i just don't like the process of getting there so it's the act of traveling that has just been really challenging for me for quite a few years really and i find it to be super stressful getting up super early in the morning you're in tight confined spaces you have poor quality food choices you're rushing to catch flights and make your connections. Sometimes, oftentimes, you have questionable lodging, you got to rent a car, and all the things that just cause travel in itself to be super stressful. But in the last few years, we can add a huge EMF exposure to the list. So, not only are we sitting in a metal box in the sky, but our seatmates, most of the time, are wearing 
wireless earbuds. They're using Wi-Fi on their phones or their laptops. They're wearing smart watches and who knows what else these days. So for those of us that are sensitive to EMF, this can cause a lot of symptoms, as you know. And for some of us, it can just make flying completely impossible. Um, but then on the other hand, for those of us that aren't especially sensitive, we're still getting bombarded with human-made EMFs that can leave us feeling groggy, confused, irritable, impatient. It weakens our immune system and can cause loads of oxidative stress. So for many of us, it can feel like it's just not worth it. And, and if that's the case and you're like me, you avoid air travel at all costs. But there are times when we can't avoid it or some of us fly regularly and we just want to be healthier and feel better while we do it. So that's why we really wanted to bring you some of our best tips on how to do just that. So let's take a quick second to look at some of the health statistics regarding flying. So when I was digging into the science regarding how flying and EMF impact the body, I found some pretty interesting information. There are a few studies you can find online that speak to the long-term health outcomes of flight personnel. In one study, flight attendants reported more health problems than the general population, which is probably not much of a surprise to anyone here. Not only do they have very stressful jobs, but they can experience constant sleep challenges from altered time zones, constantly changing circadian rhythms, several known and probable carcinogens, including chemicals from the airplane, but they're also exposed to cosmic radiation on an almost daily basis. And though cosmic radiation is a naturally occurring electromagnetic field, being so close to it inside a metal box 30,000 feet in the air is not. So prolonged exposure to cosmic radiation in conjunction with a bombardment of human-made EMF very likely has negative health implications. So according to the Harvard Flight Attendant Study, Flight attendants had a higher prevalence of every cancer that was examined, especially breast cancer, melanoma, and non-melanoma skin cancer among females, confirming multiple US and European studies. Job tenure was linked to non-melanoma skin cancer among females with borderline associations for melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer among males. So this information was based on a 2014 to 15 study survey of 5,366 flight attendants. So it's worth noting that the CDC did do their own study on flight attendants and did not come to the same correlations that the Harvard School of Public Health did. However, the research for Harvard is ongoing and data continues to be collected. So if you wanna look more at this, you can visit this website, the uh, Harvard Flight Attendant Study, as you can see on your screen to find out a little bit more about that. So, of course, airline pilots are also impacted, not just the attendants. And research has also shown an increase in specific cancers, as well as altered circadian rhythms and other negative health outcomes among pilots. You can find more about this research at the website listed here at disciplesofflight.com. Now, remember, we're talking about flight personnel who spend a great deal of time in the air every week. Most of us have a tiny fraction of this exposure, so I don't want anyone to worry about this too much. And of course, here at SYB, we're about solutions, not doom and gloom. So there are numerous things you can do to protect yourself while flying. In fact, I was so excited about this opportunity to help others learn about the tips I use when I fly. I actually decided to create an entire course around it. So I'm just going to take this opportunity now to announce the launch of our brand new course, Four Steps to Flying Healthier, Healthier and Feeling Better, because when I started to really dig into this topic, there was just so much information. I knew it couldn't fit into the space of a webinar. The course is just jam packed with information ranging from what it means to be electro hypersensitive, how EMFs impact the body, how to lessen your symptoms to EMF, how to prepare for the flight, what to do when you get on the plane, what to do immediately after the flight, what to do at your destination, and just a whole lot more. Now, I know that R wanted to wait until after today's webinar to announce this, but I'm sorry, R, I just couldn't wait. I'm just too excited about it. 
but I'm pretty sure that he is going to have a really great offer for everyone regarding this course at the end. So do stay tuned and stay with us. So the course itself has seven modules, over two hours of videos, 30 plus handouts and checklists, uh, over one and a half hours of bonus videos where I teach you how to test your home, hotel, wherever you're staying uh, for EMF. But we're only here for a short time today, and I wanted to give you some of my biggest takeaways from the course so that you can start implementing them right away. So as a quick reminder or possibly as a quick introduction, for those of you that don't know how EMFs impact your body, let's take a quick look at how electromagnetic fields impact us on a cellular level. So ultimately, it comes down to oxidative stress. And this is important because this is going to help us correlate the information that we're going to see in a minute on how to combat this type of exposure. So thanks to the work of uh, some researchers like Dr. Martin Paul um, from Washington State University, we know that EMF exposure causes oxidative stress on a cellular level. And if you haven't looked into the work of Dr. Paul, I encourage you to do so. He's got some great videos on YouTube that you can dig into this much deeper. In short, what he and other researchers have found is that when a cell is exposed to non-native EMFs, they can activate the voltage-gated calcium channels on the cell. So we know that there should be abundant calcium on the outside of the cell, but when there's too much inside the cell, this is when problems arise. So we know now that all EMFs activate the voltage-gated calcium channels in the cell membrane and increase this intracellular calcium ions. So they artificial, the gates open because they're controlled by voltage and we are in contact with voltage from EMF. And then all this calcium floods in to the cell and then this increased cellular or intracellular calcium can act to stimulate nitric oxide synthesis. This leads to the creation of proxy nitrite, which leads to free radicals and ultimately oxidative stress. Okay, so that is a very short, brief overview, um, but it, it kind of helps us understand this on, on, a, on a bigger level here. So then what happens? Well, this oxidative stress leads to a host of symptoms, including all those you see here on this list, plus more. This is by no means an exhaustive list. So I don't know about you, but for me personally, whenever I fly, I experience insomnia, tinnitus, irritability, anxiety, headaches, blood sugar imbalance, weakness, and heart palpitations, right? So why do I want to fly if I'm going to experience all of that? Um, of course, this isn't only because of EMF, but, you know, the entire experience of traveling. So I'm just curious. I, I'd like to see if anybody wants to pop in the chat what the symptoms are that you, you personally experience. I'm always very interested in that because everybody's very different. Um, and then that can, you know, help us um, when other people are experiencing some of these symptoms. Yeah, Kimberly wrote a, a, an interesting comment about not only the in-flight Wi-Fi, but, but the, the, in, the in-seat screen. So when your head is yeah. laying back on your chair, you have the screen right behind your head. Yeah, I have actually measured that. So I, I often will take my meters on the plane and do this very discreetly. Um, I haven't, I, I have, the last time I was on a plane and we had the, the screens on the seats, I didn't get too much of an increase from that, but it was a, a quick, short little test. So uh, it, it wasn't exhaustive. You know, uh, the, um, the last time I took a flight, which was uh, this month, well, actually now last month in October, the plane was a newer plane and it didn't have screens in the seats. What it had was phone holders. So it was encouraging people because oh. the in-flight entertainment system was delivered over Wi-Fi. So it encouraged people to put their phones right where you would normally have those in-flight displays. Ooh. Yeah. So Mark says heart palpitations, anxiety, lack of oxygen, headaches. Mm -hmm. Rosalind says fatigue, uh, numbing and burning pain. And Rhonda says definitely anxiety as well as aching muscles. Do these sound yeah. uh, familiar to you, Kathy? A hundred percent. Yep. 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 Very, very, very similar. Um, 
Yeah, I'm looking at that. Those. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly how I feel. It's very that's it's very very common. It's such a bummer. Um. Okay. So then the big question is, well, what do we do about this? Which brings me to my first tip for you, which may be obvious, um, maybe not, but antioxidants, of course, are the way to combat oxidative stress, one of the best ways. And thankfully, we can get loads of antioxidants from our, our food. And we got to do that a couple times a day. So you can also get them from supplements. When I'm flying, I do both. Um, I like to load up on the antioxidants and supplement form your oh we lost your screen no i'm sorry yeah when I, I was trying to respond to somebody in the chat and i can't do that so i, I apologize please proceed of course. Uh, <laughs> so yeah so supplements or food um you know our daily cho choices that we in, in our food should be uh potentially geared towards a high antioxidant level depending on what kind of diet you're on unless you're doing carnivore or something like that um but this this can be very helpful in addition to supplementation. So um, I'm sure that most of you know antioxidants come from our deeply pigmented, color rich fruits and vegetables. So as they say, eating the rainbow is a really good idea. Um, now, while you're making your food choices, even starting a few days before you fly anytime, really, you just want to think about loading up on these antioxidant rich foods and I would say bringing them with you when you fly because we all know how difficult it can be to find good choices at, in airports and while on the road. And I talk about this at length in the course, but you know, you, it surprises me how many people don't travel with food. My backpack is like full of food when I get on the plane and I've never had a problem with it. TSA has never, you know, they're just like, oh, you got all this food, but they always let me on with it. Um, so I just kind of prepare everything, package it in little Pyrex containers and I bring it with me because God forbid I'm caught in an airport with uh, airport food. It's not going to happen. So I definitely encourage everybody to bring food with you. Um, okay. So in addition to this, supplementing with antioxidants, I think is really important, especially with this higher dose of oxidative stress that we're going to get while traveling. And this is something I've been doing for many years, and I've noticed a big difference. Um, so I use many i mean there's so many great antioxidants and the ones i choose it varies depending on how long my flight is how i'm feeling that day what kinds of things i'm going through in my life at that moment you know things like that um but it would be way too complicated to try and explain all of that in the webinar so i wanted to narrow it down to my top two favorites and i gotta tell you this was pretty challenging because uh, I have such a great list and I, I do cover them all in the course, but these are the two that I simply will not fly without. And they're very accessible and relatively inexpensive. So drum roll, please. They are uh, magnesium and rosemary. So of course, magnesium is, an, is a mineral, not an antioxidant, but it is the ultimate calcium channel blocker. So if you're not already taking magnesium um, you really want to consider it so remember i'm not a doctor i'm not giving medical advice here uh, if you decide to try a specific supplement or diet you always want to check with your doctor first that said magnesium works really well to combat the effects of the artificially opened voltage gated calcium channels that we get with emf exposure and in addition, magnesium is just, it's got numerous benefits, including supporting energy production, cardiovascular health, nervous system regulation, musculoskeletal health. It just, it kind of does everything. And so it is one of my favorite supplements by far. Um, I'm a big fan of taking magnesium in supplement form so you can get that concentrated amount, but there are some notable food sources of magnesium that are worth mentioning. And some of the highest sources are spinach, pumpkin seeds, almonds, lima beans, and everybody's favorite, chocolate, right? Chocolate. <laughs> um, so there, there's some others, um, some grains. I'm not the biggest fan of grains per se for most people. Avocados have a little bit, bananas have a little bit, but these are, you know, actually spinach, lima beans, pumpkin seeds are the top three and chocolate has, has a good, a good uh, dose too. So I will say 
Um, for anyone that's dealing with oxalate issues or, or has a propensity to kidney stones or, or uh, gallbladder stones, spinach and chocolate are actually not your friends because they're both extremely high in oxalates. So are almonds actually. Um, so those are best avoided. But if you don't have those problems, then good for you. That's, you can enjoy them at will. Okay, so rosemary, um, one of the most underappreciated plants, in my opinion. So everybody loves to talk about turmeric and blueberries and kale and acai and all these so-called superfoods. The little old rosemary hardly gets much attention. Yet, there is some really impressive research on the radioprotective benefits of rosemary, specifically rosmarinic acid, which is the active component that protects against radiation. So I really love rosemary for these benefits, but also because it's so incredibly accessible. You can cook with it, drink it in a tea, take it in a capsule, use it in the air as an essential oil, or my favorite way of taking it, especially when flying, is as a tincture. So I just love rosemary, and it's one of the few spices that I actually use almost every day. Um, so th those are my top two faves. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, many of you are probably employing these already, but you know, that the rosemary really gets little attention. So, and it's um, delicious and it is so delicious and it smells lovely and you can grow it on your windowsill. I mean, <laughs> so good. Okay. So that brings me to tip number two, um, which is to use protection devices. Now this might sound obvious to you and perhaps you're already doing this but i do want to take a moment to point out some important things here it's not as cut and dry as you may expect so when i say protection devices i don't mean pendants necklaces harmonizers and these subtle energy devices there's an awful lot of those products out there and i get questions about them probably every day um but the fact remains that we just uh, we can't scientifically verify if they work. I know that there's live blood cell analysis and heart rate variability and muscle testing, which is all valid um, to some degree, but they're also um, you can influence th those types of tests. Um, and it's not I mean, for me to make a recommendation on these, I need more than that. I want to see my meters change. I want to, I want to see a little bit more hard science. Um, again, I use those tools, um, but in this case, I'm not ready to recommend one uh, for that reason. Now, if you're using them and getting benefit from them, awesome, that's great. But there isn't one single product that I've come across that gives consistent results across the board for all people. Some of these, one person will get benefit from and then another person feels worse some people spend you know i just spent five thousand dollars on this thing and i have no idea if it's working well like that's a you know that's a big investment to not know so the thing that concerns me the most though is that i've seen many people feel better when they begin using them and then weeks or even months later they actually feel worse and i'm just you know that's not a risk that i'm willing to take with my clients um because obviously I don't want that to happen to anybody. So what I prefer are actual fabrics or items that specifically block EMF. So the items that most of my clients have success with are things like hats, blankets, shawls, scarves. Um, you know, we can definitely verify these work with our professional grade equipment. So um, it is important to note though, that not everyone feels benefit from clothing or fabrics. So while most people do, there are some people that might actually feel worse when they wear them. Um, so this is something that you definitely want to test drive before flying. So there are a few reasons for this. Um, one is that not all products are created equal. Some companies produce low quality items with cheap materials that don't work or they off gas chemicals. And if you're EMF sensitive, it's highly likely that you're sensitive to chemicals too. And obviously you don't want another insult there. Um, so with these products, it truly is a situation of you get what you pay for. Um, of course, you know, I'm a, a clear fan of the Shield Your Body products that are made with the highest quality materials and really do work. Um, I do discuss a few other brands inside the course. 
Um, but, you know, I just want to talk a little bit more about another reason why some people don't feel well with the clothing is that if they're in a high electric field environment, the clothes can actually attract some of these electric fields and some sensitive people um, can react to that. So most people that I know to solve this problem, they wear an underlayer uh, with the protective fabric over it so that it's not touching their skin or the hats um, typically don't cause that issue. Um, if you're maybe if you're like R and you don't have a lot of hair, that may be a consideration. <laughs> but um, hats, I haven't seen that much of an issue with. It's more of like the long sleeve t-shirts, oftentimes that you wanna wear over um, a, another layer. So, and again, not everybody has that problem. You just wanna test drive it before you get on a plane so that you can know, you know, know what you're getting into. Um, okay, so uh, actually though, you know, having said all that, for a lot of people that I know, using these protective fabrics can literally be the difference of I can or cannot fly. So, so without them, they wouldn't be able to fly at all. And with them, it's tolerable and they feel much better. So they're definitely worth investigating. Okay, so my third and final tip, which is a little more elusive, but incredibly important, is to create a resilient body. So what do I mean by this? Creating resiliency means that you support your body, every aspect of your body, to be as healthy as possible, including physical, emotional, and mental health, so that when you're exposed to insults like EMF, you will be able to handle them with much more ease. So your body's defense mechanisms will take care of the stress and you'll feel much less, much less symptomatic as a result. So as you can imagine, this is a huge topic. And in fact, the majority of the course is spent identifying all the ways that you can create resiliency as well as looking at the underlying um, precursors to why somebody becomes sensitive. Generally, in my work, I see that there was an event or a trigger, an infection, a trauma, uh, exposure, you know, something that tips us over and then we become sensitive. So we got to identify those underlying precursors and I lay them all out in the course. But then, you know, what do we do about that? So it really is kind of a hard truth that most of us are not giving attention fully to our physical health, our mental health, and our emotional health. And some of us are great at exercising every day, eating a beautiful diet, sleeping well, yet we kind of neglect working on our past traumas or our emotions. And some of us dive head first into healing our emotions, but we can't find the discipline to move our bodies and eat well. Um, you know, to be honest, some of us try really hard to do all three, but think we can figure it out on our own when we could really use some guidance. And then some of us just like to ignore it all and keep searching for that magic pill. Now, I have done all of these. I'm guilty of every single one of these at some point in my life. So if you can relate to what I'm saying, you know, don't feel bad, we're all human. It's just uh, human behavior to try to find the easiest ways. But unfortunately, if we want to make that true healing, we got to do the hard work. Um, so all the magnesium and rosemary in the world, while very helpful, um, won't be enough if we don't work on our bodies first and all the parts of our bodies. So if this is an area that you neglected, this is just a friendly reminder that putting some attention here can bring you a tremendous amount of healing, which will leave the body in a in a parasympathetic state instead of the sympathetic state. We want to put it in the parasympathetic state that we all desire. And when our mental and emotional body is healthy, our physical body will follow. So I can't tell you how many people I know who have suffered from physical ailments for years, even decades, including being sensitive to EMFs, that found almost complete recovery from their symptoms when they finally addressed their past traumas and emotional scars. Now, I'm not here saying that it's easy, uh, but this is an area that must be addressed if we truly want to enjoy optimal health. And when we do, everything becomes easier, including traveling. So by beginning the journey today, you can yield massive results weeks, months, and even years later. 
So, you know, like I said, we talk about this at length in the course, but I want to give you at least one powerful tip you can start using right away to begin to shift your body into that parasympathetic nervous system, which is really the first step to creating a resilient body. And that would be to practice your favorite breathing techniques. Some of you may be shaking your heads. This may sound overly simple, but you got to believe there is no more effective way to instantly bring your body into a calm and relaxed state. So there are several different methods out there. Um, and if you have a favorite one, great. I encourage you to do that. My two favorites are the 478 breath um, and the Wim Hof breathing technique. So these are both incredibly powerful breathing techniques that I recommend to all of my clients. They're simple, they're free, they're quick, and you can find guided instructions for both of them online. Again, that's the 478 breath and the Wim Hof breathing technique, which I suggest you do daily for the most profound benefits. And in fact, since we have time here, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and do one. So um, I've got a, a quick three minute video that R is pulling up for us uh, by Dr. Weil, who famously teaches this technique. And so we're gonna do it. So I teach this quite a bit. Can we pause it for a sec? Okay, sorry, before we get ahead of ourselves, I wanna just help everybody to get into um, a state where you can really take advantage of this. So I wanted, I wanted to do this with the video by Dr. Weil because his voice is just ultra soothing and calming and um, he's just, he's got the perfect voice for it. So we've got three minutes, you guys. I know you're all busy. You may have multiple tabs open. I, I want you to try to just come to this for three minutes Turn off your phone, which I really hope is not on right now. Um, close the door if you can. Um, just get comfortable for a minute. Okay. So you can sit on the floor. You can lay down on the couch. You can rest in a chair with good posture. I just want you to take a second to get quiet and comfortable. And remember, this is only three minutes. So just relax for these three minutes. You don't have to do anything. Don't worry about what's coming next. Just see if you can tune in here and, and follow along with this video for these three minutes. Okay. The famous 478 breath, the relaxing breath that I teach to all patients and doctors and students and friends, uh, another yoga breathing technique. Uh, in this, you try to keep your tongue in the yogic position, touching the tip of the tongue to the ridge of tissue just behind your upper front teeth like that and try to keep it there the whole time. You breathe in quietly through your nose to a count of four and you hold your breath for a count of seven and then blow air out forcefully through your mouth. <sighs> Helps if you purse your lips out and you make a whoosh sound when you do that. So the exercise begins by letting all the air out through your mouth. Then you close your mouth, breathe in silently to a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven out through your mouth audibly to a count of eight, and you will repeat this for four breath cycles. Looks like this. That's it. Um, you must do this at least twice a day. You can do it more frequently if you want, but never more than four breath cycles at one time, at least for the first month. After a month, if you're comfortable with it, you can increase to eight breath cycles, and that's the absolute maximum. 
it's desirable to slow the whole exercise down as you practice it. What limits you is how long you can comfortably hold your breath. But as you practice that, you'll get better and better at it. And um, after doing this for four or six weeks, uh, you can begin trying to use it for things. Um, if somebody says something that pushes your button, you do this exercise before you react. Uh, it's a great way to deal with cravings. It's a great way to help you fall asleep. If you get up in the middle of the night for any reason, get back in bed, you do the exercise, you'll fall asleep easily. After two months, three months of regular practice, there are very significant changes that happen in physiology. This lowers heart rate, it lowers blood pressure, improves digestion. Uh, it is a very powerful anti-anxiety measure, in fact, much more powerful than the anti-anxiety drugs that are commonly prescribed. It takes no time, needs no equipment, very time and cost effective. Everything to recommend it, so I urge you to begin practicing this. Okay, um, how did that feel for everybody? Uh, I know I'm super relaxed and didn't really want to come back right this second. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> I, I love it. So, I mean, hopefully you can see how simple and effective this technique is. And I hope you feel inspired to start doing it every day. I've been doing it for about 20 years and I find it to be one of the most valuable tools I have for supporting my nervous system. Um, now, I am also a big fan. Can we go back to the uh, PowerPoint, R? Awesome, thanks. I'm also a huge fan of the Wim Hof and so you can see his name up in the right hand corner um, if you want to Google that. I actually, I think for me, this method, the Wim Hof method, is a little bit more powerful. Um, it does take a little bit more time, 10 to 15 minutes, maybe, depending on how you do it. Um, but boy, I tell you, I it, it's like it's like the equivalent of doing an hour of meditation for me in, in 10 minutes. It's amazing. So it's really transformational and I highly recommend uh, for anyone that's interested that you look into that. Okay, so we are at, um, I think my time is about up. So this is good timing because those are my three big tips for you um, to help you travel healthier and feel better, especially while flying. And so these are the absolute minimum steps that I take when I fly. Really, you know, I do a lot more and I lay them all out for you inside the course, but I could talk about it all day because I'm just so proud of it. But I know that R wants to um, make some announcements and I wanna save a lot of time for your specific questions. I see we've got some coming in. So R, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to you. Thank you very much, Kathy. And as Kathy said, um, and by the way, great presentation as always, Kathy, thank you so much for, for contributing your knowledge and expertise to the SYB community. And as uh, Kathy already uh, ruined the surprise, everyone knows we have a, a very special announcement here tonight. And that is that SYB is proud to have teamed up with Kathy to bring the Fly Healthier course with over five and a half hours of videos, more than 20 PDF guides and handouts, eight bonus expert interviews, over a dozen blood sugar balancing and gut healing recipes. This program has everything you need to on um, how to reset your body back into a state of health so that um, you, can, uh, you can fly healthier. The value of this course taken together, right, is well over $2,500 when you value each of the components that are included. Uh, we've seen similar prices, uh, courses priced at $5,000 and higher without all of this great information. But Kathy and I knew that if we priced it at what it's worth, not enough people would have access to the information. So, uh, and, and if $2,500, it's, it's just, it's a lot of money, especially right now with the, with the way everything costs so much, like gas and produce. Uh, so, uh, so we talked about making it available for just $500, which is more than fair for all of the value in the course. But again, we just felt like that was, uh, that was too much in, in terms of making this available to as many people as possible. So we decided to make this intensive workshop available for just $299. And again, remember for this, you get seven modules over three and a half hours of video lessons, 30 handouts and articles, all of this 
not from just some random person on the internet, but from a certified building biologist, certified EMF expert, and a holistic nutritionist. You get to experience this from the comfort of your own home on your own schedule, and it includes one full year of access. And the special deal that we have for everyone in the webinar tonight is uh, making this course available for just $99. So that is uh, normally priced at a great deal for $299. But tonight, for those of you who are in attendance live, not for anyone watching the replay, but for those who are here live, you can enjoy a full year of access to this course for just $99. And remember, this includes a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not completely satisfied with the amazing information you're getting, just contact us for a complete refund. There's nothing to return and no hassle. So again, this is to where I, I know everyone wants to get into Q&A, so I keep the pitch real short. Uh, so we'll get to Q&A here in a second, but just one final reminder, this is just tonight only. It's until midnight tonight, Pacific time. You can get Kathy's Fly Healthier course for just $99. The coupon code uh, is FLYWELL, and it's, you'll see it here on your screen, along with the shortcut shieldyourbody.com slash fly healthy. Uh, or if you go to our website, it's in the courses menu. Um, so now we will get into some Q&A. Um, uh, and for those who don't know, uh, we do. There's a Q and A pod. So if you have questions, or if you've had questions and you've put them into the chat pod, please put them into the Q and A pod. And I am going to. Um, I apologize here. One second. I have to escape, and I have to uh, because I can't. I can't monitor the Q and A pod uh, while having a keynote in full screen. So I just. I just need one second here to um, there we go. Okay, so now I can get into uh, the Q and A. So, and we had some questions submitted in advance. And so while to give you guys a couple, uh, another minute or so uh, to put your questions into the Q and A pod, I'm going to jump to one or two of the ones uh, from that were submitted in advance through the Google form. So, Kathy, here's one that I thought was was interesting. What where is the safest or healthiest place to sit in a plane when it comes to EMF? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a little challenging to answer because every plane is different. Um, so uh, typically, we like to say not to sit near the engines. And sometimes the engines are in the back, sometimes they're on the wings. So if you, I actually had to book a flight yesterday, as a matter of fact, for uh, a building biology uh, seminar coming up soon. And so when I was um, choosing my seats, I could see two of the, it, you know, the, the, it was there and return. <clears throat> two of the planes had the engines on the wings and two of them had them in the back. So you got to kind of look at that and you're going to have a less of a magnetic field um, if you can try to get away from the engines. Um, some people also think that sitting in the aisle is better than the, than the seat, the window seat because of cosmic radiation. However, in my testing of many flights, um, the magnetic field for some reason has tended to be higher towards the aisle um now again it that's a, only a few flights and every situation is going to be different the other factor that some people like to think about is where is the wi-fi router and you don't always know so you know you can't you can't call the airline and say hey on this flight that i'm taking on this day where's your wi-fi router going to be they have no idea <laughs> I mean, sometimes you can ask when you get on, but if you've got an assigned seat, that I, that might work or not. Maybe you can change seats if it's not full. Um, so it's it's a very challenging question because we've got electric fields, we've got dirty electricity, we've got magnetic fields, we've got radio frequency, and so there isn't one best place on the plane to avoid all of them. So, you know, I, I, my best tips, I know that if, we, if we're away from the engine, that's better. Um, and otherwise, you know, uh, we, we just kind of got to 
do our best on that, which is why I like all of the other recommendations here. Thank you, Kathy. Another question submitted uh, beforehand um, was uh, about the, um, the, uh, the, I don't know what they call them now, but the detector that you have to walk through uh, at security checkpoint, uh -huh. how much radiation and EMF are we getting? And is there any way around it? And I'll, before you answer, cause I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I know that there is a way around it and that is to request a pat down. And I remember once when I requested a pat down, um, the woman, uh, the TSA agent was like, oh no, it just bounces off of your skin. <laughs> like that is, that is not how this works. Uh, so, but I, I do know my understanding is it's very low powered, but it's still millimeter wave. Is that, is that it correct? Is millimeter wave, yeah. I mean, if that was true though, how would it, how would it perform its function? If it, yeah. <laughs> right. Cause it's got to go. I mean, that makes zero sense. Um, yeah, I've had that. So I get a, I don't think I've ever gone through one. Um, which is interesting because they started in around what, like 2008 or nine. And I wasn't fully aware of the whole EMF thing. I just thought, no, like, I'm not going through that thing. I don't, I'm not even sure why I thought that at the time, but um, I've always asked for a pat down. I've never had a problem with it. Um, you know, in some circumstances, depending on the airport, if, I mean, it can take a little extra time. So I do allow myself an extra 20 minutes to get to the airport. It's it usually doesn't take that extra time at all, but just to be safe. Um, I have been in some super busy airports like maybe DC airports or other where it takes an extra long time because they're so understaffed and the, the security lines are huge. So you just want to make sure you do give yourself a little time. But yeah, I have always done it. I've never had a problem. So I put all my stuff on the belt, um, my luggage on the belt that goes through the little scanner. And I say, I want a pat down or I want to opt out. And then you get a pat down. Um, it is millimeter waves. Um, so, which is interesting because the TSA also likes to tell me, oh, it's no different than your cell phone. And I'm like, <laughs> my cell phone doesn't use millimeter waves. Why, you know, but that's what they're taught. So anyway, um, it is, you know, I don't know that we know for sure the full impact of the technology, um, but <clears throat> as I'm thinking in, in terms of power density, uh, but it is millimeter waves. And I mean, why, if you have an option, if you can opt out, why wouldn't you? Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, I don't understand this question but hopefully you do I, I guess it's a it's a question about specific types of supplements so c voitas asks uh marine based magnesium supplements do you know what that refers yeah, to so she's just acting asking about different types of supplements and i'm assuming she's asking are marine based um okay versus other types um you know everybody's different and we gotta each find the type of magnesium that works best for us. Um, marine based can be okay. You know, um, the problem with marine based anything, however, is that our oceans, even sea salt, um, our oceans are filled with microplastics and other toxins. Um, so I'm a little bit cautious about that. Um, I do still use sea salt, but, um, you know, sparingly so i kind of prefer the elemental um you know magnesium glycinate malate uh threonate there's all different kinds of forms and it just depends on what which one is best for you which you know are you do you have a propensity for anxiety or is it musculoskeletal or is it um uh cognitive you know then i'm gonna tailor that to to meet the best match for you. I do go into that in the course. Um, so, but you know, everybody's different. So the, the type of magnesium is going to be dependent on the person, but you know, a citrate glycinate, I mean, they're all good. We can all benefit from each of them. It's just that fine tuning. So, you know, if you're doing the marine magnesium and you like it, great. I, I mean, I'm not overly concerned about it. Just throwing it out there that, you know, I, I kind of would prefer the elemental versus marine because of the the microplastic issue. 
unfortunately. Thank you. Um, we have a question. I'm going to jump a little here out of order. Um, Charles asked, what does one year of access mean? I don't own the course once I purchase it. That's correct. It's on a learning platform and you access it through our website at shieldyourbody.com. And uh, so the purchase is for one year of access to all of the content of the course. Obviously, the PDFs and the downloads you can keep for as long as you'd like. It's really the, the video, the video component of, of the course that you have one year of access to. Thank you. Part of that is because we try to update that as often as possible and, and continue to improve that content. So. Um, okay, also, again, out of order, we will get to as many of these as possible, but out of order here, Anonymous asks, considerations for pregnant women, babies, and developing children in days leading up to flight and while on plane. Um, uh, yeah, what, what to do given their more susceptible blood brain barriers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so pregnant women, you know, I do like the belly bands. Um, you know, they make the belly bands that have shielding and you could, you could use the blanket like the, um, the baby blanket that shield your body has. That's great, uh, for pregnant bellies. Um, um, I, I mean, this is a little bit tricky because, you know, supplementation is good. But of course, uh, most supplements we can't say are safe during pregnancy because we can't ethically test them. However, magnesium is no problem. Rosemary is a food, all right? So those are great. Um, so uh, doing those kinds of supplements, I think, is a great idea. Um, for babies and children, yeah, um, and for days leading up uh, to, to the flight. Um, it's tough for me to see babies on planes, to be honest with you, um, because it's uh, it's a it's challenging for them, um, and I often see them entertained by phones and tablets. That's that's what bothers me. I just I, you know I it's hard to see, um, but I am not there to you know tried anybody in their behaviors. So it is what it is. But again. Same thing with um, the antioxidants. And then for babies, the baby blanket is fantastic. Um, and the beanie, the little baby hat, I think those are excellent. I mean, if I was traveling with a baby, I would 100% invest in those. I think it's, it's a very good investment. Um, and for children, um, so there, you know, as the child gets older, there are more supplements that can be helpful. Uh, you know, chewables, chewable magnesiums, um, some other supplements like astaxanthin, uh, you know, the, the foods, of course, the antioxidant rich foods, and then the shielding fabrics. So um, it's another thing, you know, and I, I talk about this at length in the course is blood sugar balancing. So if you're talking about, you know, a couple of days of leading up to the flight, you know, remembering to keep yourself in as less of a stressful state as possible. And I realize that that is very challenging, especially when you've got kids. But the more prep you can do, you know, packing four days ahead of time, having all of your food and supplements ready, et cetera, so that you have less stress the day of the flight is going to make everything m much smoother because your nervous system, again, is not going to be on heightened alert. Um, and balancing your blood sugar goes right in hand with that um, so that we don't have this adrenaline and cortisol response, which makes everything worse. So, you know, I've got a whole handout about balancing blood sugar, and I'm sure many of you probably know how to do that. Um, very important to keep just keeping the body in as low of a stress response as possible. So um, did, was there a second part to that question? No, that was good. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, Sandra asks, at what elevation does cosmic radiation become an issue? What about living at higher elevations? Does elevation correspond with EMFs? And I can start that. So cosmic radiation is an issue uh, everywhere. The, 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 the factor is, the, the, and the reason altitude becomes an issue is because the, the, 
the lower the lower elevation you are at, the more of the Earth's atmosphere exists to insulate, effectively insulate you from those cosmic forces. So you're exposed to some cosmic radiation at sea level, and you're exposed to more on a tall mountain, and you're exposed to even more when you're in a plane flying at 30 or 40,000 feet. Um, and so um, that is how elevation corresponds with EMFs. Uh, Kathy, are there are there uh, other details you'd like to add to that um, answer? No, I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much right, spot on. Cool, yeah. And so the, the amount that you're exposed to at, you know, sea level for sure and even higher, that's the amount that evolution uh, has led us to cope with and thrive with, right? So that's why cosmic radiation, even though it reaches us at the Earth's surface, that's why it's not talked about as an EMF risk because that's that's a force that we've all. I mean, it's literally sunlight is is one of these forces, and so um, and it's just the higher up you get, you know, the more of this you're exposed to. And again, when you're up at at, at a plane at the altitude of a plane, um, that is not a level that we evolved to uh, to cope with. Um, uh, R is asking, oh, answering questions. I got it. Yes. Um, yes. If you have questions, please, uh, post them into the Q and a pod. That's where I'm, that's what I'm working off of here. Um, Kelly asked what, uh, e-learning platform do you use? We're using one that's built into our store. So you would access it through once you, uh, enroll, you access, uh, through our website and, um, if you go to our website under the courses menu, you'll see there's a link to just access your courses. Thank you. Okay, let me jump back into order here. Oh, another question from Sandra. Um, how do you make your rosemary tea from fresh or dried herb? Um, I typically buy it dried. I, I'm a big fan of the traditional medicinals brand of tea. Uh, I, I think they they're just very high quality. Um, so I typically do it that way, uh, but you could do it however you want and you can experiment, you know, that's the great thing about herbs is, I mean, sky's the limit. Um, I also like to buy bulk herbs from uh, Mountain Rose uh, online, which are fantastic. So, you know, you could get dried rosemary from them and just steep it. Um, I like to also combine my rosemary with nettle tea and nettle while I don't make any mention of that in the course, which maybe now I'm thinking about it, maybe I probably should have it's one of my favorite herbs of all time. So nettle tea can really help with um, to lower a histamine response and uh, EMF uh, exposure can increase our histamine response so so combining nettle with rosemary tea and what I do is I put it like in a mason jar a taller mason jar and put about oh maybe eighth of the jar uh, you know which is what I don't know uh half a cup of herbs and then pour boiling water on it let it sit overnight and then drink that during the day amazing um it's a beautiful thing really is great for actually bone health because um Nettle tea is really rich in minerals. It's very helpful for prostate health and it helps to lower histamine response. So that's, that is a pro tip for you guys today. It's one of my favorite things. Thank you. Um, Mana, or I apologize if I am saying that wrong, uh, asks, how do you use rosemary essential oil? Is that topical? Um, I have not used it topically. I have used it in a diffuser. Okay, so it's in a diffuser. Thank you. Uh, Rhonda asks, is, should rosemary only be taken in supplemental form or is the herb more effective for cooking? I think you get a higher protective dose in a supplement, it's just more concentrated because when you're cooking with it, you're only using a really small amount. I mean, it's, it's, still, it's still helpful and I still recommend it. But if I'm getting on a plane, I'm going to be taking, a, I take a tincture and that's, how, that's, I take the tincture with me and I'm doing it a couple times during the, during the flight. Well, depending on how long the flight is, I do it maybe three or four times a day. Okay. Thank you. And that also answers, um, 
Uh, oh, well, Beth asked a similar question, but then she asked specifically, uh, can rosemary tincture be taken aboard a plane? I believe, right? Because you can take I'm up never, to those yeah. little, you can take, I, I forget the actual. Three ounces, I think. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You know what, guys? I probably got one right here. Let me show you. Um, Should have had that. Oh, look, I have my shoes are bony. <laughs> Just happened to have that. So I've got, nope. I, oh, look at this. I switched bags. This was not planned. By the way, I switched bags to my new <laughs> pouch deluxe. <laughs> and I've got my rosemary tincture in here. So this is the one that I use. Um, it's the um, Herb Farm tincture. I've never had a problem bringing it on a plane. They've never, in fact, I, I mean, I just have this in my bag, literally when I'm flying. They've never looked in my bag. Um, they've never given me any uh, I've never had a problem. So yeah, I think that size is safe. So thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, this is an interesting. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but the question sounds interesting. MT asks, are there better or worse times of the day to fly from the perspective of your health? So um, there is a thought that if you fly at night, that you're going to avoid some more of that cosmic radiation emf sun exposure you know happening but the problem with that is i'm cons i mean then your circadian rhythm is all jacked up right so um i mean i know that if you get the first flight of the day you're much less likely to have delays um in missed connections the first flight of the day is usually on time uh and i think that's important because um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention in this webinar, I didn't think we'd have enough time, is that in the airport itself, you get a big dose of radar, um, much less than you get, you're not really getting it in the airplane, at least that I've been able to measure. So if you're sitting in the airport, you're getting, you, it's potential that you're getting a huge spike of radar every five seconds or so. I have found for me personally that that bothers me more than being in the plane, so I don't want to sit in the airport all day long so sometimes those early morning flights can be better. So that you're not delayed in getting an excess exposure by sitting in the airplane and potentially missing a connection, etc. Um, but you know if you're very sensitive flying at night may be better. Um, for me, I don't like that because of the circadian rhythm challenges. Um, the circadian rhythm is imperative for you know our nervous system, our overall health, and how we feel. So I guess it depends on you know which is more important for you. Thank you. That was an interesting answer. I appreciate that. Uh, before I jump to the next question, I, I see Michael uh, put into the chat pod. Uh, could you clarify what you mean by radar in the context that you gave? Because you mentioned oh. radar in your answer. Oh yeah, air, airport radar. So uh, sorry, from the from the airport tower communication to to the planes, the airport radar that they're using. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Joanne asks, um, and it's something I think you covered early on in your presentation, so she may have missed it. Uh, uh, and there's another question that was submitted in advance that I think you can maybe combine both. So Joanne asks, what are your thoughts on Shungite to reduce EMF? I have a small round disk in my phone, but not sure if it works. And then someone asked in advance on the, the Google form, do you think taking travel size Soma Vedic device would be helpful? Okay, so Shungite, I mean, if you want it, I bring, bring it, great. You know, I've, I've got some of that are hidden in pockets here and there, I think. Um, you know, again, I don't know if it works. There is some pretty compelling research that shows that it could be protective. Um, you know, I'm encouraged by it. I just, I just, I just am not confident enough with the research that I have to say yes or no. Again, lack of research doesn't mean that there's not a correlation. Um, so I, I don't think there's any harm, right? So if you want to bring it and you feel better with it, fine. I think that's that's fine. But yeah, I'm not sure how, how much it, it, it's helping. Um, and then let's see, what was the second? Soma Vedic. Soma Vedic, yeah. Um, okay, so 
I believe with the handheld device of the Soma Vedic, you ha it has to be charged like every eight hours or so or something with the other unit, if I am correct. I don't know. I don't have one. It is actually the only protective device, device that if somebody is absolutely desperate and has done all the things, I might suggest they try the Soma Vedic. And I say that only because I have multiple clients that have really benefited from it. Um, Again, I, I typically don't because of all of the reasons that I said, I still can't sci scientifically verify it. And I don't, you know, my biggest fear here is that people's going to get a protective device and I see this all the time and they're like, oh, I feel better. And then they start using all of their devices as much as they want. That is not going to work out for you. All right. Just because you might feel a little better with this thing on your phone doesn't mean you can use your phone 24 seven. So I'm nervous about that too. Um, but yeah okay so using this small somavetic device i mean if it holds its charge long enough because i think it's like eight hours before it has to be charged with the bigger one i mean again i don't see any problem with trying um i know it's a tiny little thing so it's worth a try thank you um anonymous asks uh so they let the tinctures through but any emf protective clothing devices or anything we pack uh, can raise red flags when it goes through the conveyor belt scan, what to do in these cases. I'll, I'll say, I mean, it might not surprise people to know that I travel with a fair amount of EMF protection devices. Um, the only one that's ever caused any kind of issue for me is sometimes the laptop pad, because that's always in my carry-on. And sometimes that'll that'll warrant, uh, they'll pull it aside and look through the bag and they'll even see the pad and have no idea what set off the, because uh, the, the, the issue is the, the scanner can't see through it. Um, so, but uh, that's the, the closest thing I've had to any kind of, like they just look at it and they, they wave me through. Uh, none of my other, like I, and I'll wear, I'll wear the uh, SYB boxers. Um, nothing ever really sets off any issue. Uh, Kathy, have you ever had issues with EMF shielding going through airport security? I have not. Um, you know, I'm usually getting a pat down. So I usually have, I'm wearing the clothes, but I've had stuff in my bags. Um, occasionally they will go through my bags while I'm doing the pat down, but I've never, they've never taken anything or it's never been a problem. Yeah. Thank you. And I forgot to hit answer live. So that's okay. So Michael asks, um, I'll try to summarize this basically, uh, uh, because, oh, he, because I, earlier I brought up the, 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 the issue of that, that new plane I was on that didn't have the, uh, the in-seat, uh, display. Uh, so he's wondering if the smaller planes may result in less exposure or whether wide body airliners with higher ceilings and more space, uh, uh, or, or, or maybe have lower net exposure. Basically, the question is, you know, are you aware of what the differences are? Like you, you said, it was hard to answer the question earlier about where in the plane is best. Are there, do you have information about what kind of plane might be better than others? A smaller one, bigger one, older one, newer one? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know. I mean, I know that smaller planes, well, I mean, this is kind of irrelevant, but like, you know, I used to live in Alaska and got on the little two seaters often. Boy, those are, you know, talk about magnetic fields like, whew, you know, Oh, really? I'm, yeah, because you're right next to I mean, you are right next to the engine. Right. But in no bad, inflate Wi-Fi, I imagine. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Wi -Fi. <laughs> Sometimes no bathrooms. So be careful about that. Um, always no bathrooms. But, um, you know, I, I can't say for sure, Michael, but um, I'm feeling like I, you know, you mentioned the wider planes with more space. I, if I had to guess, I would expect that those would be better, but I really don't know. Um, some of this is, you know, we need more data. Um, we need more of us to be taking measurements. But again, that's really hard because if I'm in the exact same plane, but my neighbor next to me has eight devices on on one plane and the next time they don't, I'm not going to get good results. I, you know, I, I, my, my data is not valid. So uh, it's really difficult to say. I think that I feel better in the bigger planes than the smaller ones. And um, I'm assuming that's just because 
of this issue, you know, the closer you are to all the stuff, the much higher your exposure is going to be. Thank you. Okay, so we have one final question here, and this is last call. So if you have questions, put them into the Q&A pod. But at this moment, we have one final question from Beth. Um, so uh, magnesium L theronate is the only form of magnesium that passes the blood brain barrier. So might that provide additional protection for the brain while flying? Do you yeah, know so, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. Three and eight magnesium three and eight. Um, yeah, that's true. It's, it is magnesium three and eight is the best magnesium for, uh, cognitive issues. Say you're having whatever, you know, you want to improve memory or anxiety or whatever nervous system, cognitive brain issues that you might have. Magnesium three and eight is the best. And it is the only one that crosses a blood brain barrier. So I would agree Beth, that it could be one of the better options in this case. It is more expensive than like a glycinate or a malate or a three and eight. Um, but if cognitive issues are your thing, definitely go for the three and eight. Um, it's not, it, you know, the glycinate's great for like, again, anxiety and, um, you know, it's, it's nice and calming. Um, malate's great for that musculoskeletal stuff. So, you know, um, it's, and you can get different formulas that have all three or a combination. Um, but I do agree with you, you know, three and eight is worth trying because it can be, it can be great. Thank you. We have another question come through uh, from Anonymous. Can the EMF hoodies or EMF blocking clothes, if not fully covering every inch of our body, result in whatever small amount of EMF entering through openings and bouncing and multiplying? Yeah, um, <clears throat> there is in the in our professional community, there are we do have conversations about that. Um, there is a risk of that. And it honestly kind of seems to be person dependent on whether or not someone is bothered by that or not. Um, for that reason, I mean, I have a, a hoodie um, that I don't typically use the hood on it for that reason. Um, if I do, I'm gonna like put the, you know, the shield your body neck gator around it or something. So it kind of can close up a little bit um, or, or use like a hat. Um, so, you know, I, that's why I, I like the t-shirts or, you know, I mean the hoodie that I have, if I don't put the hood up, it's just a full enclosure. So um, that may be one reason why some people don't feel great while you when they're using them but generally it, it's just that's just a hoodie issue particularly because it can gap the other clothes that's not really an issue thank you um and there uh, i guess the same person asks and uh uh can can the emf protective clothing bounce waves uh bouncing waves off of you subject the person seated next to us uh getting more exposure ethically i wonder about this sometimes no that's a that's a good question it would not that that would not be indicated by our measurements i could imagine that um there could be a very small uh risk of that but in all the measurements that i have done I'm just thinking about this. I was actually doing an assessment yesterday in a, in a home where we could see a cell tower in the distance and I was measuring and I can hear the cell antenna on my meter. And when I opened the door, the measurement went down and it stumped me for a long time. I, I, you know, I, was, I was like, you know, I, I've never seen this before. What's going on? And of course it dawned on me after a few minutes, oh, there's another antenna coming from the other side, right? And it was bouncing off of the, the double pane low E glass. So when I opened the window, it was letting it out. But when I closed the window, it was increasing. Um, so I have not, however, experienced that with clothing. Um, and I imagine it's because the clothing is mesh. And so it's, it's going to be more potentially absorptive rather than directive like a wind redirecting like a window would be it is a good question and i think it would be 
a valid point to continue to measure that to make sure you know if you've got a meter i would just measure it to make sure that that's not happening um but so far i haven't seen it be enough of an issue that i would be concerned about my neighbor but but i like your line of thinking it's, it's a good point um another question came in what other areas and airports would have the most and least radiation density oh um I, th there's there's no way of knowing i mean we don't know where all of the fancy equipment is you know we're dealing again not only is it radar and and wireless devices and wi-fi in the airport and probably security uh technology and uh you know communication technology etc that's in the airport but it's also electric fields magnetic fields and dirty electricity we we literally have no way of knowing um that's why i like to travel with the meter so i can turn it on and go sit in the place that's so, low yeah enough. what meter do you like track because you obviously in your carry-on you're not going to bring your whole kit what meter do you like traveling with uh my safe and sound pro uh 100 awesome on that i've got that on my website if anybody wants to look at the meters that i like safe and sound pro 2 for sure and i bring my nfa 1000 with me which it's a two thousand dollar meter so i know that people aren't you know going to do that um but that's the magnetic and electric fields that i use you can use a tri-field meter for that or a cornet and then um just a little small um handheld am radio um, I actually released a YouTube video this week on how to use an AM radio to detect dirty electricity. Um, you know, it fits in the palm of your hand and it's amazing to identify where you're getting the dirty electricity from, you know, it costs 25 bucks. So <clears throat> I would, you know, for anybody that wants to see that, go to my YouTube channel and watch that video. Um, and those are the three that I fly with. So um yeah you could also just do like a tri-field or cornet or something like that cool thank you um okay michael asks one more question uh should we wear emf protecting shoes or a mat to place feet i've never i actually haven't seen emf protection uh, i've seen socks but not shoes i have not either um I mean, I mean, it's all about how much of your body you want to cover, right? You're not, because if you were going to get full coverage from a protective device, it would have to look something like a hazmat suit. And that is not going to be practical. So it's about the areas of your body that are most important to you. And when you, uh, you have exposure in those areas, you feel, so it's about protecting the, the organs that are most important to you and protecting your, your sense of health and well-being. And so if, if your feet, uh, if, if exposure to your feet are triggering symptoms, then I would say for sure, uh, look into, into protecting them. I don't know what a, a mat would do in that instance, but the, you know, socks could, could help. And, well, and if you're talking ask. about a grounding mat or something like that, that's a big no. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, you would have nothing to ground it into on a plane. Oh, well, I mean, maybe not they do have a grounding system in the plane to disperse fields right, but there's no uh, there's no like outlet at, at yeah, each. There, yeah there is not on a most, three on a three a three-prong outlet uh, at the seat well i don't know i haven't paid attention if, if it's three-pronged yeah i see usb ports but that's I, oh any any <laughs> yeah don't don't use a grounding mat on the plane you know, um uh let's see uh, can you uh anonymous ask can you take the emf meter in your carry-on the answer is yes mm -hmm. i do I've, all the time yeah i mean at least i've never had an issue uh and it shouldn't be an issue you can bring on all these kinds of devices so yeah that is fine um great so i think that about does it for tonight uh almost everyone has stuck around for the full q a almost an hour of q a so thank you everybody uh for taking the time to to show up this evening and thank you Kathy, for again, sharing your expertise and insight on, uh, I mean, I, again, I know just how many people care about figuring out how to fly healthier. I, I hear, I mean, I know myself and I hear from so many people about what it does to them. So this content is phenomenal and I really appreciate you sharing it. A reminder for everyone uh, that this deal that you see on the screen 
uh, will last until midnight tonight Pacific time. So that is, uh, what is that? That's like nine and a half hours from now. So you have nine and a half hours. You can look over the course at shieldyourbody.com slash fly healthy, see uh, all the details and you can enroll there. And the coupon code is fly well. So thank you everyone. Uh, oh, and the web, uh, this replay will be posted probably by tomorrow morning. You should get an email with the link uh, for future viewing. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great, have a great night.